a thing happened today, and I guess AMD stock's rising, but uh, will it be Vega Vici? You already used that joke. I definitely already used that joke, but that's okay. <laughs> it was a good joke, and we're going to use it again. <laughs> well, my interest in AMD is rising. <laughs> yeah, but we got to make sure that there's nothing in the package that's surprising. <laughs> we should stop now. <laughs> Uh, so, Ryzen X370. X370 is the only one that we've gotten to look at so far. It is a uh, AM4 micro pin grid array, and the it's the X370 chipset. Um, I guess so. We compare it to X99 and KB Lake. Obviously, that those are the big competitors, and probably the the first big comparison we look at is PCI connectivity. Of course, with X99, you have uh, 28 or 40 lanes. With KB Lake, you have 16 plus 4. Uh, X370, it's kind of in the middle. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's Goldilocks. It's like the three bears. It's like, you know, one of the things that we complained about when we were doing our KB Lake benchmarks is that it's like, really, we're still at four cores, and there's not like a six-core part. I mean, that's coming with Cannon Lake, I guess. But then on the you know at the upper middle of the road on X99 you got the thousand dollar eight core and the seventeen hundred dollar ten core. Uh, that's not, I'm not really feeling that either. Then we have X370 and AMD sort of situated it right in the middle. Um, it's a it's a little weird. So you guys remember the diagrams uh, that we were talking about on the news and some of the other stuff where it's like I don't, I'm looking at this and it doesn't make any sense because it's like SATA connectivity or NVMe connectivity. There's, it's like, I need a block diagram of the system. Well, I finally have a block diagram of the system. It makes sense. Those diagrams, I understand what they're talking about now, and it's good. Okay, so check it out. This is uh, this is courtesy of Asus. This is for the Crosshair motherboard. But uh, generally, you get the idea. I really wish that I had this. Now, uh, AMD had two diagrams that they were showing. They were showing the X370, and then they were showing the Enthusiast 8-core 16-thread part. And now it kind of makes sense. So you see the AMD AM4 processor has direct connections. It has, you know, direct interfaces for some of the USB resources, dual channel DDR4, PCI Express by 16 for the graphics card or by 8 by 8 for two graphics cards or two peripherals. But there's also a PCI Express 3.0 by 4 interface for M.2 or NVMe. You get the, the Realtek audio resources, which is just a red herring. We're not going to talk about that. I mean, audio on the CPU. Okay, whatever. Then you get the PCI Express by 4 connection just like Z170, just like Z270, just like DMI 3.0 on Intel, and that is connecting to the X370 chipset. And then from there, you get more, you get your SATA connectivity, you get more USB connectivity, you get uh, your PCI Express uh, Gen 2 interface, you get your Intel LAN adapter. How funny is it that uh, AMD's running Intel LAN and Intel wireless on, <laughs> or I guess a lot of board integrators or board manufacturers are opting to go with, with Intel for those. Well, I think it's pretty common knowledge that everything else is inferior and most people are just going to put a card in if you don't give them yeah. their Intel. Intel does make a damn nice Ethernet adapter. And I finally feel a little bit vindicated because like the i210 on an Intel motherboard is actually more functional than like an i219 or an i217, 218, 219V that's integrated into the CPU. So... Like, yeah, i211, next generation, it's integrated into the motherboard. Woo! I think at this level of enthusiasm for parts, you're not going to pull the wool over their eyes with a network adapter. Now, the one interesting thing about the block diagram is that the USB 3.0 ports, now these are USB 3.1 Gen 1 or, you know, USB 3.0, depending on whose marketing stuff you're subscribing to, but they're, they're the USB 3.0 five gigabit per second ports that support the USB 3.1 signaling, which is more efficient than the USB 3.0 signaling, but it's still five gigabit per second. Those, some of those are provided directly off of the CPU, but the USB 3.1 interface is provided by a connection through the X370 chipset. So that's kind of interesting. I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised they didn't put the 10 gig interface directly into the CPU. That is an odd choice. Now, you might be looking at these PCI lane numbers and saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to adopt Ryzen because I need my dual Titans. <laughs> I need my SLI. But I, the reality of the situation is it's not going to affect your performance that much to have the more limited lanes. That Maybe if we have super video cards in the future, but not the foreseeable future? No. 
it's not it's really not going to matter yeah. so you could totally run dual cards with these pci lanes and it's not going to affect your performance in any way that you're going to notice yeah gamers nexus i think it was steve at gamers nexus um he ran the benchmarks and it was a less than one percent performance difference with the absolute top end cards that they could get running them in by 16 or in a by 8 configuration so I think that pretty much seals the deal on PCI Express 3.0 and eight lanes of connectivity. It's not going to be a bottleneck. It's not going to be a problem. I don't really see that as, as an issue at all with X370. I mean, even running, you know, mixed configuration, like you're going to run a 10 gig or a dual 10 gig or a 40 gig Ethernet card in the future, along with, you know, PCI Express by eight for your uh, graphics card, not really a problem. Now, everything that's running through X370, that is going to be limited to... Uh, your 32 gigabits per second total bandwidth that you have through X370 to the processor. So like if you have all of your drives, like if you're running nothing but SATA SSDs and you've got tons of PCI Express peripherals or tons of other stuff, then theoretically I could I could imagine that you could bottleneck that. The other bad thing about this is that you can't run dual M.2, at least it would be difficult to run dual M.2 uh, in PCI Express 3.0. The only way you could do that was with a PCI adapter and run your graphics card at by eight. Um, there are a lot of Intel motherboards out there now that support dual PCI Express 3.0 for your M.2. But if you really look at it, the all of the M.2 is running through the Z170 or Z270 chipset. So the chipset itself has the same bandwidth that is passing through to the M.2. Uh, and right now, you know, if you're running like the Toshiba RD400 and like a RAID 0, you're totally bottlenecking the uh, the interface on Z170 or Z270 because the, the, it's PCI Express by four. You can't you, you you can't get blood out of a turnip. It's just not fast enough. Um, whereas with this, I think if you were running one M.2 directly into the CPU and one M.2 on one of those those adapter cards, then that's you know <laughs> that's directly into the CPU. There should not be a bottleneck there. That's something that we need to test and is on the list of stuff to test, but we haven't gotten there yet because we just got our stuff. Now another. Interesting thing about Ryzen, uh, you sort of think about it as the budget part because you look at those prices, Yeah, they're low, right? You wonder, okay, where did they cut the corners? But in terms of build quality, you put these up against the <laughs> Intel counterparts and yeah. you find some surprising things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, already some people have been doing some D-lids. There's links to that in the description as well. And, you know, these eight core parts are soldered. AMD has used solder. And there's also some capacitors and things like that under the integrated heat spreader. And those have been sealed with silicone. So, you know, compare and contrast that to uh, Skylake and KB Lake where it's like, oh, they didn't really even use a proper solder thermal compound. And people are delitting KB Lake and getting 15, 20 degrees C differences. Uh, yay, AMD for putting it together the way that it's supposed to be. <laughs> now, having said that, though. Uh, the overclock so far, the best we've been able to do is 3.8 gigahertz on two cores and uh, 3.4 when using all eight cores. Yeah. So it's not got the clock speed of its competitor. <laughs> that's on a 1700. So, you know, that's not really that far above, you know, like the spec that it normally does. We have not really pushed the voltage. Uh, the This Tai Chi motherboard can deliver 300 watts to the processor. We have not tried to put anywhere near 300 watts into the processor yet. Uh, but it's on the to-do list. Uh, so far, it also seems like uh, ECC RAM is totally working, right? Yeah. In Linux, it's really hard to know. Like, how do you know in software that ECC is working? Well, it turns out that's a really difficult question to answer. You sort of, the software that will tell you has to sort of have the right magic handshake with the hardware. And we're not really sure that any of the software has the right magic hand, handshake with the software. So we set up Fedora 25 and set up Linux kernel 4.1. And the only clue that I have that ECC is working is ECC as, is reported as working on at like second number seven in the boot up process. It says, you know, like AMD, uh, M, MDAC or yeah, MDAC is, is uh, reporting that a DRAM ECC is enabled. But if you run, you know, like the, the DMI dump or like the EEPROM dump from the memory, it knows that the memory is ECC, but like the, the bit widths are not reporting is like 72 bit versus 64 or wider than 128 bit. So I don't know 100% that ECC is working, but I think it is. I also downloaded Rowhammer. So we did some Rowhammer testing to try to flip bits and corrupt bits in with DDR4 because I was able to get non-error correcting memory to produce flipped bits with Rowhammer. 
but that could also be the memory kit itself and the ECC kit that we have from Kingston uh, was not able to um, was not able to 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 generate any flipped bits. I have not tested the Kingston HyperX kit. We got this really awesome Kingston Kingston HyperX DDR4 3200 kit. Um, the first five or six revisions of the UEFI that we were messing with, uh, getting the memory timings past 3,000 was problematic. So I think 2933 is going to be safe out the gate. Um, I think that because it's a new platform, it's going to be a little bit fiddly. The RAM timings are a little bit weird. It is only dual channel. You can run up to four dims, but it is only dual channel. So like super clocked memory, uh, it's it's too problematic at, at the current stage. And most of the motherboard manuals that we looked at, you know, it's like, oh, support up to DDR4, you know, like 2633 at the at the top end. But we have been able to get 2933 stable on the stuff that we've tested so far. So, And there was a... A little more latency than expected, especially when using all of the memory slots. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. It's uh, we're getting memory latencies of around a hundred nanoseconds when we would expect memory latencies of like sixty nanoseconds. Don't know how that's going to translate into real world performance yet, though. I, I dare not hazard a guess because then we enter hype territory and we become the thing that we hate. <laughs> Could also be that a, a UEFI update is lurking around the corner. Well, I mean. If, you know, honestly, I would have liked to have had more time to do this because, you know, there's at least one UEFI update that we got that completely changed the parameters of testing. And so it's like, yeah, we're going to publish all our benchmarks and stuff. And it's going to be great. And it's like, no, no. The only advice we can give you is that honestly, probably for the next week, take the benchmarks with a huge grain of salt because we've seen wild swings in performance with, you know, relatively minor uefi updates so keep that in mind that's that launch day patch culture <laughs> right up to the last minute yeah amd probably forgot how to do a launch so. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while sorry i mean not untrue i mean good job so far though yeah yeah uh, these are the boards that we've gotten in so far there's a there's a an asus crosshair formula on the way supposedly that's going to have five-way optimization and automatic overclocking I have not done well with overclocking on AMD yet because I've got no information and no idea what I'm supposed to do as far as overclocking goes. So I haven't done really well with that. We've got this really awesome Aorus uh, Gaming 5 from Gigabyte. Um, we're just getting our feet wet with this. This is a really, really awesome board. We've got this really amazing uh, cooler from Thermaltake. It's the Contact Silent 12. It's a nice uh, cooler for Ryzen that's not like something overly complicated or something completely insane. And then we've also got the Kingston HyperX um, kit that we're going to use for testing. I'm pretty sure that DDR4 3000 on all of the motherboards that we're going to test will not be a problem, but that's going to be included in our, in our full test suite. And then, of course, the ASRock X370 Tai Chi. Uh, this has been a really interesting board. I like the Tai Chi's in general because ASRock tries to not give you any crap. And uh, in, in terms of like, oh, we don't, we're, we're not going to give you all the extra features that nobody extra, actually uses. We're just going to give you a motherboard that has the stuff that you actually need and is at a reasonable price. And I think it's 189 for the ASRock, about, uh, about 200 for the Gigabyte, and about 250 for the ASUS, which, you know, given like the Z270 launch prices and the performance that we're seeing, holy crap, that's, that's a really good deal. Yeah, the motherboard CPU combo it's going to be considerably less. It's, it's really looking that way. Yeah. I, you know, again, just preliminary testing, but I think I would characterize Ryzen, the eight core as basically a server CPU stuffed into a desktop chipset. But I wouldn't discount it for gaming and other enthusiast level yep. uh, applications yep. just because of that. I mean, it's, it's going to serve that purpose at a price point that's going to be competitive. Yeah. On, on Linux, for like the multi-core workloads and multi-thread test workloads, it works really well. So far, I have not had good luck getting uh, IOMMU grouping for like KVM pass-through, so like video card pass-through. I have not had good luck with that in testing. The IOMMU groups groups the, gra the graphics cards in the system together, or it groups everything through the X370 chipset in one IOMMU group. So like if I install a PCI Express 2.0 graphics card, it's going to be in the same uh, IOMMU group as like the SATA ports and everything else that's connected to the, to the X370. Hoping that gets changed with a firmware update, but so far the, the virtualization testing has not 
uh, has not for for pass through has not gone well for other kinds of virtualization where you're just running a ton of virtual machines and you've got a lot of like I/O load contention. So far, that's going really well. It does seem like this chip, it it shines when all of the cores are being used. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. I think that uh, if you're looking for just like raw performance and you can get by with four cores or less. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I think you may you may want to wait and see how the R5 is because supposedly the Ryzen R5, you know, that's going to be a six core part. Some of them, or maybe all of them, and four gigahertz on the clock speed, uh, you know, and and on up. And that's certainly easier when you're talking about six cores versus eight. Uh, that may be something that you wait for. That's coming Q2 of 2017. So, yeah, the 3.4 clock versus four out of the box. Yeah, for those kind of applications, you should probably wait. We also don't have our 1800X yet. We pick that up tomorrow. And the 1800X, supposedly, if the thermals and everything is right, it'll turbo up to 4.0. We don't know if that's 4.0 on all cores, but it'll turbo up to 4.0, supposedly. And if we can push that, you know, 4.2, or you know, maybe even a little bit better than that, that may be a game changer. But so far for testing, like, uh, programs that are like a one or two threads it does okay i mean with the with the 1700 we see it clocking up to 3.8 gigahertz but uh it, it's going to need more testing to really say for sure to really say definitively i like that the m.2 is wired directly into the cpu though i think that 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 ultimately will have been a wise decision from a system architecture standpoint and also it's important to note that when we say you know the other chips might outperform for single threaded type things uh, we're not taking into consideration the cost yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you still could get a better value even for single-threaded applications with Ryzen. Well, I guess the question is, would I rather have two Ryzen systems or one 8-core Intel? And right now it's, it's squarely in, I'd rather have two Ryzen systems. Seems reasonable. Is it the case that I would rather have a Ryzen 1700, the $350 processor, versus a KB Lake system clocked at 5 gigahertz? That I'm not sure about if it's a choice between only those two. But stay tuned, and we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out empirically. This is not going to be subjective BS where it's around feelings and nonsense. <laughs> no, this is not safe space testing. <laughs> well, that's all we've got for Ryzen. Um, we're going to try to now. The, yeah, for now. We're going to try to do the testing. Hell, we may even pull this video down once we've got something better to replace it with. It's on telling. But uh, if you guys have any questions or you want to share benchmarks or you want to do anything like that, uh, we should have the the first video out the gates. Can probably going to be the Azrock Tai Chi X370. That was the first board that we got, and uh, I did Linux testing with it and some, some pretty heavy benchmarking um, in Linux, mostly very little Windows benchmarking so far. Um, but we're going to try to get that out the gate and some more details about my IO MMU setup and the output of LSPCI and that kind of thing. Look for that. And then next up is going to be the Gigabyte Aorus X370 Gaming Five. And after that, probably the Asus. So, and then more boards after that too. One thing that you didn't mention that is going to be extremely important to our audience: all these boards dripping with RGB. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, this, this the the Astrox actually got three RGB headers: one for the fan because apparently AMD has an RGB fan, and then two other RGB connections. I mean, oh, and it's got RGB fans around the X three seventy chipset as well, so you can like you can. There's, it's just, it's RGB everywhere. Tons of RGB. Also took a lot of uh, macro photography, so maybe you guys can use that as like wallpapers or backgrounds or something. Hopefully we remember to upload that to the forum. <laughs> That's all we got. We'll see you until next time. See ya.